Why and how are the Democrats using the boogeyman, as you called it, of Russian collusion to delegitimize Donald Trump? Yeah. Well, behind the whole Russian collusion story is a, a, a fact that if you look at local offices, state governors, uh, the governorship, state legislatures, the House, the Senate, the presidency, the Supreme Court, all the reins of power are out of democratic hands. It's been destroyed as a party by Barack Obama. He created a paradigm of ginning up minority identity politics support and alienating the working classes that was not transferable. Hillary got the downside of alienating but not the upside of the minority support. And it, under his reign of eight years, the Democratic Party imploded. That's, and they're angry about that. And they look at Hillary Clinton, they can't believe that she blew this, what should have been an easy victory, they think. And in response to that, they have to explain it. And Hillary said Comey did it, she was a woman, but she also said the Russians did. Now, we have to be empirical. The Russians always throw gears in our election, uh, but I mean, Bill Clinton spoke for a million plus dollars to very various Russian avenues. Hillary Clinton did things as Secretary of State that were very dubious, like allowing our a quarter of uranium um, assets of North America to go into Russian hands. But I think the Russians, for them, that if Flynn or Paul Manafort, whoever they were, had Russian contacts that were commiserate or similar to those in the Democratic Party. They made that into something. And yet, we know that he was surveilled. We know that James Clapper, the head of the intelligence agency, said there, were no, there was no evidence of collusion. We know that the FBI uh, paid money to have research that was completely bogus, even by uh, the Democratic Party realizes that Trump did not go to a hotel room and engage in sexual deviancy with Putin operatives. So this serves an, a psychological need, but also it, the idea is if you keep saying it enough, the big lie, then you weaken his public approval ratings, you weaken his public approval ratings, you peel off Congress people, senators that don't want to be associated with him. And then finally, there is evidence, uh, and we know there's evidence, that people in the Obama administration surveilled people surrounding Trump, and those names were unmasked, perhaps by Susan Rice, perhaps by John Brennan, perhaps by James Comey. We don't know who they were. At best, that was unethical, but if it was reverse targeted, in other words, they didn't just uh, surveil Russian operatives who happened to, in that net, bring up Americans, but rather they used that as an excuse to go after people in the Trump campaign, or they colluded with people in Britain or Estonia or somewhere to bring that in. Uh, information so they could unmask it and leak it. We know they leaked because that came up during the campaign. That's that's the real scandal. And by saying Trump colluded, Trump colluded, Trump colluded, then we as we directed our attention away from the real story. And that was very effective with James Comey because he kept saying in testimony, "We're investigating collusion," but he would never answer whether he was investigating the unmasking, which I think is a much more uh, uh, potentially damaging story. Well, I think three people were impediments to finding out what really happened with the Obama administration and the use of the intelligence agencies to not only surveil, but to leak that information to pet journalists. And they were James Comey, uh, James Clapper, and John Brennan, the head of the CIA, director of national intelligence and the FBI, and they're all gone now. To me, that's sort of like a dam on a river that's that's broken. And now there are not people invested in their careers or in the Obama administration that will that will protect uh, sources and will will deter people from coming forward. So I think that we'll see start things that will start to trickle out. We've already seen it in the case of Susan Rice. We know that she unmasked people. She would not testify about it. And I think now that these people are gone out of the Intelligence Committee, people will come up within the Intelligence Committee and say, you know what, what we did was wrong. And I think we'll see things in the next six months that are quite surprising.
So talk about the political and cultural resistance to Trump and almost the Trump derangement syndrome that we're seeing. What are the what's at stake if the Democrats and the left are so uncivil that they can't accept a new government? It's a good question because it's a two part answer, I suppose. One is what caused that derangement syndrome? And what are the ramifications of it? What caused it, I think, is almost a class bias. You see a little bit of it with the never Trump on the Republican side. And they look at Trump and they see, see wow, his appearance, his personal life, his Queen's accent, his taste, his gaudiness. It just doesn't fit the Washington, New, New York, understated, privileged, elite value system. The way he talks, the way he acts, he hangs out with wrestling people. He uh, he likes Mike Tyson. He, he's just uncouth. And so a lot of the anger and furor against him was, I think, class-driven. Because if you actually look at his positions or his prior political life, which had been kind of left and center, there was no reason to incur that hostility. The other thing is, where does it lead? And I think the Democrats have a problem. That is that the ruling class of the party is geriatric in the sense that Nancy... Pelosi is 79. I mean, I'm 63, so I have nothing against old age. Diane Feinstein's 83. Jerry Brown, I think, almost 80. Steny Hoyer's 77. Um, so you've got people who are from a different generation. And the new, younger generation are, in some ways, unhinged. Uh, Perez at the, D at the DNC and Keith Ellison, they're not a corrective for that. So they're in search of an identity. and their reaction to the loss of 2016, if they were sober, would have been, we, our blue wall crumbled. And that's because we didn't visit those states enough, we didn't appeal to pay book issues, and we, we talked so much about white privilege among the elite, we didn't realize that the people who had white privilege are elite and are left wing usually, but the people who didn't have it, we castigated and called irredeemable or deplorable, and Obama had called them clingers and we have to win those people back. And so it, it reminds me of 1968 when Humphrey came close and the obvious remedy for his defeat in 72 would have been to say, you know, you can't have a George Wallace come in and steal the working class vote that lost you the election in 68. You cannot have uh, a Chicago convention riot on the screen where the Democratic Party is being torn apart by the left. You've got to get back to centrist issues like JFK or something. Instead, they reacted the other way. We weren't hard left enough. We have the Voting Act of 1971. We have the 18-year vote, and so they nominated George McGovern. So I see something like that, where Hillary, they should have said, Hillary won the popular vote. We would have won those key states had we visited them and, and stressed economic issues. And now the answer is, we didn't have enough Black Lives Matter transgendered issue, climate change. I think they're going to end up like they did in 72. Let's talk about the best things about Donald Trump and the aspects about his governance that worry you. I know you worded that question very carefully about his governance, governance that worried me rather than his character. So I'll, I'll stick to your question. Uh, I think he's unpredictable and he's not shackled by traditional political uh, restrictions. So he can say anything to anyone at any time. That's supposed to be volatile, but actually unpredictability both in deal making, as he knows better than we do from the Manhattan real estate arena, is a plus. And he's using that to his advantage overseas. So what I see for the first hundred days is an, a dangerous effort, but an effort nevertheless to restore deterrence. So he's trying to remind Iran or China or Russia the Middle East and General Korea, that the last eight years were an aberration. And it would have led to an escalating provocative stance by st states that are weaker than we are. And they had, in an aberrant fashion, convinced themselves that they were not weaker. So what he's trying to say is, we United States is a enforcer of world norms. Please don't be provocative anymore because it's going to end up badly for you. And losing deterrence under Obama was dangerous, and restoring it under Trump will be dangerous. But eventually, like Reagan's corrective to Carter, it will be okay. I think domestically, there's a lot of hysteria, but I think we had gone so far on the progressive trajectory that we forgot what the normal 
center was in American politics. So Trump comes back and says, they approved the wall years ago, it was funded, I'm just going to finish it. Uh, Dakota, Keystone were approved, the EPA tried to stop it, but even Hillary Clinton's State Department had no environmental objections. The tax reform is basically going not back to even Reagan's, but back to George W. Bush's rates. So what you guys consider revolutionary is only revolutionary because you're revolutionaries. But I'm going back to the center, the Clinton-Bush center. And, you, and then we get to the point, well, why is it so hysterical? Because the Democratic Party is really being led. It doesn't exist as a party of ideas. I mean, Hillary ran that on, the, on the premise that she wasn't Donald Trump the monster and she was a woman, but she didn't have an agenda of issues because the LGBT issue or the global change, climate change issue or the identity politics, black lives, these were media-driven phenomena. They were not thought up by local uh, assemblymen or state senators in the Democratic Party. They were, came from down on high by the media, and that's what drives the Democratic Party. So in some sense, Steve Bannon was correct when he said there's the Republicans and then there's the media as the oppositional party. Other than that, I think Trump has done pretty well. It would be easy and, and maybe cheap to say he shouldn't Twitter or he should be less uncouth, but you get the impression that the downside of that is outweighed by the upside. Of people were so starved for being candidness and, and candor and bluntness. So that I think he's done pretty well so far, but it's, it's very hard to, to restore deterrence and get politics back to the center. Um, to what extent was the Trump victory on election night a repudiation of Obama's policies? Yeah. Well, Trump was a repudiation of Obama. We, we forget one thing that until January of 2016, the cumulative positive approval ratings of Obama had been dismal, one of the lowest in, in record, much lower than George Bush until his last year. And then Obama wised up and thought, the less I'm seen and the less I'm heard, the more popular I am. So he hit the golf course or just stayed away and let the Republican and Democratic primaries divert attention and made him look in comparison quiet and calm and charismatic. But that didn't hide the fact that uh, if we would look empirically at his issues, they, they were, he was the first president in history that never in eight years achieved 2% economic growth. And that meant that thousands of people in real terms of family income, I should say millions of people became poor. Uh, if you look at the lead from behind uh, foreign policy, he left the Middle East by the withdrawal from Iraq, the Iran deal, the bombing, and then Skidoo from Libya, the Syria red lines, he left it a mess. The reset failed with Russia. China built a military base in the Spratly Islands. So that it wasn't an impressive, it was a d dismal foreign policy record. He doubled the debt. We, we owe $20 trillion. He did, no president. Uh, had quite done that. George Bush almost did it, but he doubled the debt and left us uh, in a no-win situation where after eight years of zero interest rates, which really stagnated the economy, what do we do now? We go back to normal interest rates and we double the cost of financing this huge debt. So he, I, I compared him once to Stanley Baldwin, who knew that if he could just get out of town okay without a war or depression, he was a success, but he he did, he did things that are not going to be popular. And then finally, his post-presidency is eerily reminiscent so far of the Clintons. He, after saying you didn't build that, it's not the time to profit, you've made enough money, he's now adopting the Clinton model of a foundation, the Clinton model of a library, the Clinton model of Wall Street $400,000 lectures, the Clinton model of staying in Washington, the Clinton model of having a mansion in Washington, the Clinton model of wink and nod that my wife might also have a political career in the way that Bill did with with Hillary that leveraged what should have been a retirement into a second career and so that's that, that didn't work for Clinton because he was a, a liberal but it surely doesn't work for a progressive to have that sort of elitist cash-in attitude about a post-presidency.